Even in murder, God works in mysterious ways. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, April 17, 1986. A devout man finishes his nightly prayers at synagogue. This isn't just any night. It's the first night of Passover, the holiday where Jews remember their liberation from slavery in ancient Egypt. But not everybody is celebrating tonight. Pittsburgh police get a tip. A gang of armed robbers is about to strike again. There's been a shooting in Squirrel Hill, Pittsburgh's affluent Jewish neighborhood. Caught on the trail of the robbers, they red ball it to the scene. I say it took us only approximately three to five minutes to get to this area. As I jumped out of the vehicle, I ran over to him and I asked what had happened. And he says, uh, he says, I'm shot. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Nearly 20 years after that fateful night, Constable Stagina can still remember the face of that frightened young man. He gave me his name at the scene. It was Neil Rosenblum, and he told me he was uh, a rabbinical student, and he was staying, living, I think, in Canada at the time. I tried to make him comfortable. We tried to cover him up because he was cold. He started showing me his wounds at the time. I could see one in his wrist, and then and when I opened his coat, I could see blood in his shirt and around his chest area. I asked him what happened. Neil says he was on his way back from synagogue when a car drove up. The man in the passenger seat asked for directions. He said, uh, I said, I'd step off the curb to give him assistance. They just shot me. They shot me for no apparent reason. Neil describes his attackers. Two white men driving a black Corvette. Black Corvette? I says, uh, you sure it wasn't two black guys and two black females in a, in a dark hell of sedan? He said, no, it's definitely a black Corvette. Now, Stagina knows that the men who shot Neil Rosenblum are not the armed robbers he's looking for. He asks for a more detailed description of the shooter, but the paramedics need to get Neil to the hospital. He asked me, he said, am I gonna die? At that time, I assured him that he was, and he then asked me while they were working on him if I would go get his wife. Neil's wife and her family have been waiting for him to begin the Passover celebration. Instead, they hear about the shooting. His wife was, was uh, she was beside herself. You could just tell, you know, she just, uh, she couldn't believe that it happened. She was asking so many questions and I, I couldn't answer them, you know what I mean? Why, what happened, you know, just, all I could say was, you know, he was shot, we're still investigating, you know. Stagina offers to drive her to the hospital. But when they arrive, they hear the shocking news. Neil has died in surgery. Stagina never gets to ask him more questions. And Neil's wife never gets to say goodbye. The shooting of Neil Rosenblum is now a case of murder. Detective Ron Freeman takes charge at the scene. In the years since Neil's murder, he has worked on many other cases. Still, he remembers the details of this one right down to the caliber of the bullets. There were two 380 slugs, uh, uh, two 380 casings found at the scene, so we knew that the 380 had been used. 
The bullets and shell casings are sent to a firearms lab to trace them to a gun. Police start canvassing the homes and apartments near the crime scene, looking for a witness. We have several, uh, several neighbors who heard what they thought were backfires, firecrackers. They eventually realized that they were uh, gunshots. And based on everything, a composite of what the police were able to tell us and the, the neighbors, none uh, saw anything. The streets were empty because of Passover. At the lab, the two bullets recovered from Neil's body are added to the 380s found at the scene. So what we had received were four full metal jacket bullets, two, three, and also a copper jacket fragment. All of these bullets were uh, compared using the comparison microscope and found to be fired from the same firearm. The firearms examiner analyzes the unique marks on the bullets made by the barrel, the firing pin, and the breech face of the 380, and she compares them to other bullets they have on file. If she finds a match, this could give police a solid lead to the killer, but the bullets don't match anything in their files. So they were placed in what we call the open case file. And the open case file is a collection of bullets and cartridge cases uh, recovered from crime scenes where no gun has been recovered. Detective Freeman now turns to the family to see if they can help him find a motive for the shooting. He learns that Neil was 24 years old, studying to be a rabbi. Married for just over a year, he, his wife, and their baby daughter arrived in Pittsburgh earlier that day to spend Passover with his wife's parents. And all we learned uh, about him, that he was basically a very religious man and involved with his family very deeply. Abraham Kurtz knew Neil since they were children. He thought about other people, he, um, and he cared about other people, their needs, you know, how to make things better f for his school, for his parents, for his wife, I mean, for wh whoever he met. He never did anything, said anything, and no harsh word ever came out of his mouth that you ever would have been in a fight with him. Clearly, Neil Rosenblum had no enemies. That leads Freeman to one conclusion. We could see no reason for him being shot other than the way he was dressed. I felt initially, as did everybody else, that this was a hate crime. This was an especially uh, difficult and, uh, case for us because the victim, again, was truly an innocent person. Neil's body is flown home to Toronto and buried according to Jewish law. His parents are devastated. The Jewish community is saddened by the random shooting and alarmed by the anti-Semitic overtones. In Pittsburgh, police move into high gear. The public is pressing for answers. You need to find who would walk around our city or drive around our city and just choose a citizen at random because the way they're dressed and kill them. That's a serious situation. Police get thousands of calls pointing the finger at anti-Semitic groups and racist organizations. And we had to track all of those down because you don't know where it's going to lead. It just took us off in every direction imaginable. Amidst this flurry of time-consuming activity, police stay on their only solid leads, the 380 gun and the black Corvette. We started looking at every 380 that was registered in uh, Allegheny County, and then we tried to correlate that with anybody that had a Corvette and a 380. Police also pull over any Corvette seen driving in and around Pittsburgh. They work around the clock, but still they have nothing on the Corvette and no suspect from the anti-Semitic groups. It's as though some spirit has come and committed the crime. With a hate killer on the loose, are the streets of Pittsburgh safe? Is the murderer looking for targets like Neil? who are wearing the distinctive clothing of Orthodox Jews. Nobody knows, and everybody's afraid. A year goes by, then two. 
Neil Rosenblum's family and friends commemorate the anniversary of his murder. A somber occasion made sadder by their belief that this was a senseless hate crime. They're not the only ones who remember. Although the case has ground to a halt, Pittsburgh police haven't given up. We were always aware of it, uh, always thinking about it, always talking about it in the office. And uh, then at some point, we got a call from an attorney, and the attorney told us about a client of his who had information on this case. By a strange coincidence, it's two years, almost to the day, since Neil's murder. The client's name is David Green, and he's serving time on a drug conviction. Since Green has been in prison, he's been sharing a cell with another guy who's also in on drug charges. First, he thought that would give them something in common. Pretty quickly, though, Green realizes that his cellmate was nothing like him. He saw the guy drawing a swastika. Then he started complaining to Green about the Jews. Eventually, he told Green that he hated Jews so much, he and his buddy Mike spotted one near a synagogue a few years back. They drove up to the rabbi and whacked him. That smoked him. Why is Green coming forward with this? Because he's afraid. His cellmate doesn't know that he's Jewish. If it gets out, he could be next on this guy's hit list. He wants police to move him to a new cell in exchange for his cooperation. But a convicted heroin user isn't the most credible informant. Freeman needs to verify Green's story. His first step is to check out his cellmate, Stephen Tilsch. We learned through other government agencies that were investigating him, uh, federal agencies and local agencies, that Stephen Tilsch was a, uh, uh, a mid-sized drug dealer in the outskirts of Pittsburgh. And then we looked at gun registrations everywhere, we, uh, every way we could with him, but as a convicted felon, he didn't have anything legally registered to him. So far, nothing corroborates Green's story until Freeman checks motor vehicle records. Turns out, Tilsch is the owner of a black Corvette. He got a speeding ticket days after Neil's murder. Police try to locate the car. No luck. The black Corvette has vanished into thin air. Police know from Green that Tilsch was with a buddy that night. They track him down. His name is Mike O'Grady, another known drug dealer. They pick up O'Grady on the street for questioning. He remembers that he was with Tilsch on the night in question. They were renovating a house near Squirrel Hill. When they were ready to knock off for the day, he admits they tanked up on booze and drugs, got in Tilsch's Corvette and started cruising the streets. Tilsch did have a gun, but he was only goofing around, taking pot shots at street signs and traffic lights, like he often did. As for shooting a rabbi, O'Grady says Tilsch would never do that. He's a bit wild, but not a killer. Detective Freeman believes that O'Grady's lying, but his hands are tied. He knew that uh, we couldn't force him to say anything. We couldn't force him to take a polygraph. We couldn't force him to do anything. But we thought we're on the right track now. Given time, we can flip him. We can convert him to our side. Once again, all Freeman can do is wait. He knows it's only a matter of time before O'Grady gets caught doing another drug deal. That's when he'll have the leverage to get the truth about Stephen Tilsch. But O'Grady keeps his nose clean. Three years go by. At the scene of another shooting for armed robbery, police recover a weapon. The gun is sent to the same firearms examiner who worked on the Rosenblum case. 
It's the kind of gun that you see in the movies, all the bad guys, all the drug lords and things like that. She compares the bullets from this gun to others on file. It's a routine check. But she finds a match, a match to the gun that killed Neil Rosenblum. The question is, can it be linked to Tilsch? There was no uh, manufacturer stamped into the frame of the uh, firearm, and there was no serial number on the firearm. This is no accident. The gun is homemade, put together by someone with criminal intent. Uh, gun manufacturers found this loophole, and they could send you a kit, and it didn't have a serial number, and there's no way to trace this. Freeman expected the murder weapon to crack open the case. Instead, another disappointment. But he's still clinging to one last ray of hope that Mike O'Grady will talk. Then, in a strange twist of events, Freeman is called to the scene of a car crash. The driver is seriously injured. It's Stephen Tilsch, recently released from jail and apparently, once again, out for a drunken joyride. The passenger is none other than Mike O'Grady. The accident has claimed his life. I mean, he was our, our link, and it was very frustrating because now he's dead. And every time we something positive developed, then there was something horrible that would jump up and stymie the investigation, and we couldn't go any further. Call it an act of God. Call it pure coincidence. Freeman's last hope is now crushed. After five long years, the case goes stone cold. But the detective won't let it go. Thirteen years after Neil's murder, his wife has remarried. His daughter has grown up without knowing her father. His parents still mourn the loss of their innocent son. Given the evidence so far, a drug-addled jailhouse snitch, an untraceable murder weapon, and the only eyewitness killed by the suspect himself, hoping to crack the case has become an act of faith. Some cases you just cannot forget. Other cases you can. But there are some cases that homicide detectives just will not forget, and they will not let them go away. And this was one of them. After so many years, Freeman's faith is mysteriously rewarded. A new murder case lands on his plate. He's pretty sure the junkie who's been arrested knows more about this case than he's told police. And so we said, we know that you have information on a murder, thinking it was murder B. And he said, well, yes. And then he started talking about Tilch, murder A. Freeman cannot believe what he's hearing. It turns out that a few months ago, while buying drugs from Tilsch, the junkie heard him brag about gunning down a Jew. It's the same story that Freeman had heard from the first informant, David Green. How Tilsch hated Jews, how he whacked the rabbi. And it was just one of those wonderful flukes. It was serendipitous how that came up, and, uh, and it just fell into our lap. Freeman decides he now has enough to arrest Tilsch for murder. The DA decides to go for the max, murder one, premeditated murder. But Tilsch comes to court exuding confidence. According to his lawyer, the DA's case isn't strong enough to get a conviction. The prosecution has little physical evidence, and the two jailhouse snitches should be easy to discredit. The prosecution will have to present a very strong case. On the stand, Green describes what Stephen Tilsch told him about the murder. That night, Tilsch and his buddy, Mike O'Grady, went for a ride in the black Corvette. He let O'Grady drive because his license had been suspended. 
For a couple of months, Tilsch had been hassled by a Jewish federal attorney about his drug dealing. Tilsch was out for blood, and that night he steered O'Grady to the Jewish neighborhood. The bizarre circumstances leading to Neil's death are put together by Detective Freeman. Neil was alone, walking the few blocks to his in-laws. The Passover service had just ended. Had the service lasted another three minutes, they would never have met. Uh, had it ended three minutes earlier, they probably would never have met. Hey, money. Money. But they did hey, meet. The, uh... Tilsch was armed with a fully loaded, untraceable gun. He lured Neil to his car and then he shot him four times. All actions that speak of deliberate intent. And because God works in mysterious ways, Neil remained conscious just long enough to give police the crucial clue which led to solving his own murder 13 years later. Two white men in a black Corvette. A jury turns down murder one, but convicts Stephen Tilsch of third degree murder and sentences him to the max. 20 years for the death of Neil Rosenblum. Getting a conviction is a victory for Detective Freeman, who fought so long to solve this vicious crime. One's out looking to commit a hate crime, and the other is practicing peace and love and harmony. And uh, here we lost a wonderful, uh, compassionate person to uh, uh, one who hates. After 13 long years, Neil Rosenblum's parents can finally put their ordeal behind them. They had an affectionate nickname for their son, Nuti Shalom. May peace go with you, Nuti. When a man lives his life behind a mask and suddenly strips it away, what will he reveal? A massage parlor veteran, satisfying her lonely clients. But she's about to get one repeat customer she'd hope never to see again. Police receive her frantic call. Officers respond at once, but they have no idea what they're walking into. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Winnipeg, 2002. An armed man is holding a hostage in a downtown massage parlor. He's shot at two police officers. The one who was hit has escaped. But his partner, blinded by flying glass, is trapped in a room near the would-be killer. <laughs> Incident commander Keith McCaskill is on the scene within minutes. My job at the time was to try to ensure the safety of everybody concerned, the hostages, the suspect, and the police officers. While McCaskill assesses the situation, the hostage taker calls police headquarters. He says his name is Michael. The communications officer keeps him talking. She knows it's vital not to break voice contact. Before he's able to leave headquarters for the scene, crisis negotiator John Ormondroyd is stopped in his tracks. I'm loading all the equipment onto our vehicle, and I get a call that uh, this guy is on the phone now with our communications center. He's, he's very insistent 
uh, that he wants to talk to a, a male police officer and he wants to talk to them right now. The incident commander is out there, our emergency response team is out there and we like to be all close together so we can pass on information to each other. So one of us being you know, a distance from the incident uh, does create problems. Isolated from the team, the negotiator has to stay at police headquarters where he's suddenly plugged into a conversation with the hostage taker. Well, his conversation was very disjointed. Uh, he was very agitated. He, he wasn't making a lot of sense. He was changing subjects from one second to the next. I think at the time I was very nervous about what was going to take place. Uh, you understand that, you know, if you do things wrong, you're going to agitate the person and that may have consequences for the, the person that's being held hostage. So I sort of went through sort of a mental checklist of the things that I was going to say, uh, but then you fall back on the methods that we use to, to try and uh, calm somebody down and bring them back to a place where you can uh, talk to them. Within the first five minutes of, of talking to my client, I've asked him, how about we resolve this by putting the weapons down and walking out the door? But obviously he wasn't too receptive to that. Michael seems to be unhinged. The potential for violence is increasing. From his incoherent, aggressive manner, police suspect he is on drugs. And that makes the situation even more dangerous for the hostage and for the wounded officer still trapped near the gunman. Suddenly, Michael hands the phone over to the hostage. She says her name is Lindsay, and Michael is an ex-boyfriend. She has no idea why he's doing this. Lindsay confirms John Ormondroyd's greatest fear. She says Michael is going to kill her, then shoot himself. He's told her he's going to die in this room. And we see that a lot in negotiations where the person starts out on one track, but ultimately th the thought is uh, they're going to commit suicide. And this was sort of the worst case scenario that you'd always trained for, and now was here. Negotiator Ormondroid is desperate to get to the scene, but he can't simply put Lindsay on hold while he drives downtown. So he remains trapped in the communication center. Because of a different location John was in, uh, he had to get the information, share it verbally with a duty inspector who would telephone myself and explain what was going on. And this happened for a period of time. Well, I think after about, uh, about two hours, it, this is just getting too complicated, way, way too complicated. Just as Michael seems to be calming down, ready to talk some more, the line goes dead. I'm actually talking to a taker on a cell phone and their cell phone dies. The negotiator's position is now critical. No communication with the hostage taker means no chance to talk him down. No chance to find out what he wants. He's dead. And most important, no chance to negotiate a way to get Lindsay and the wounded officer out alive. At the scene, McCaskill has to make a decision. Sit tight or move in and at least rescue the officer. Once the emergency response unit secures the area around the trapped officer, McCaskill orders them to go. The ERU storms in. They meet no resistance. There's no gunfire, no movement from Michael and Lindsay in the next room. Just an ominous silence. Taking the opportunity to rush to the scene, the negotiator arrives at police barricades. Hostage negotiator and crisis commander are finally together. Without phone communication, how is Ormondroyd going to pick up negotiations with Michael before he carries out his threat to kill Lindsay and himself?
After threatening to kill his hostage and himself, the hostage taker's cell phone has died, cutting the only link police have to the room inside. But crisis negotiator John Ormondroyd has prepared for this. He told the hostage what to do if they got cut off. But luckily we'd sort of made arrangements as to what to do if that happened. In an earlier conversation, Ormond Droid had instructed Lindsay to search for her previous client's cell phone, left behind with his clothes. She finds it. Hostage taker and police are back in voice contact. They know that as a negotiator, I'm the person that is the go-between between him and all these people that are outside with their uh, weapons and their camouflage and, and all this. What about letting her go? Shortly after I get there, he has really started to settle down now, and now we are in a position where the conversation isn't as disjointed anymore. The negotiator is finally getting through to Michael. The agreement is made that she can leave. Michael tells Lindsay to get dressed and get out. Releasing her is a sign of good faith on his part. But good faith for what end? He has demanded nothing. No drugs, no food, no money. Police need to figure out what Michael really wants. Once police confirm that Michael isn't using Lindsay to lure them into his line of fire, they lead her out to safety. She's let out. He still had uh, his weapons. We still had no intention of, of going in there uh, as long as he's armed, because we don't want anybody else being hurt, including him. At police headquarters, Detective Jim Bletsky has been interviewing witnesses from the massage parlor for several hours, trying to get a fix on the hostage taker. Lindsay is brought in for questioning. She was obviously distraught. Um, she was very upset by what had happened. In spite of her condition, Lindsay is anxious to help Detective Bletsky. I start to just have a general conversation with her about her suspect. Uh, she had a relationship with him for two or three weeks prior to this incident. Lindsay tells the detective that she broke a rule of her trade, never fall for a client. She did, and even took Michael home. One night, she revealed to Michael that she was clairvoyant. When he asked her what she saw in him, Lindsay studied his palm for a moment and said one word, banks. That word triggered an explosion in Michael. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Lindsay began to fear her new lover. Lindsay says she became really afraid when Michael started acting out bank robberies. She began to think he was crazy, using too many drugs. Within weeks, she'd had enough and broke up with him. It's a strange account. But right now, the detective has more immediate concerns. He needs to know the layout of the room Michael's holed up in, so police can figure how to take him down without any bloodshed. While Bletsky has been questioning Lindsay at police headquarters, the standoff continues at the massage parlor. Only now, Michael is starting to confide in Ormondroy, claiming he's a legendary bank robber. At that point in time, he makes reference to a number of incidents that had happened, been happening in the, in the city of Winnipeg over the last few years. I immediately realized what he was talking about. I think I had to pull my, uh, my jaw up off the floor first. And uh, now I'm madly scrambling and, and writing notes saying, you know, you better get this information out right away just in case he is. Initially, there was some skepticism as to whether you know, maybe he's just read about it all in the newspaper, and he's wanting to, you know, fulfill a, an ego thing. And, and I was, he was almost caught in a, in a real quandary because there was part of me that wanted to uh, interrogate him, 
and find out more about the incidents. But then there's the other part of me that realizes that as a negotiator, my job is to get this person out. If Michael is who he claims to be, a notorious and elusive robber who has held up banks and armored cars over a period of seven years, then the police have dangerous work ahead. As part of the investigative team tracking the violent bandit as he pulled off one armed robbery after another, Detective Bletsky well knows the nature of his crimes. The suspect has started off doing bank robberies unarmed. He then progressed to arming himself um, with shotguns, handguns, and entering the banks, but not firing any shots. It eventually progressed to the point where the suspect would begin to fire at the guards um, and wanting to get in, in, into a gun battle. What we knew was our suspect was becoming more and more violent, and we knew that we had to do something to stop him before someone was killed. It's been seven years since his first holdup, and police have no clue as to the bank robber's identity. So far, he's committed 35 cleverly executed robberies, always working alone. Detective Bletsky doubts that this smart, disciplined loner could possibly be the same man as the coked-out hostage taker. He asked Lindsay to tell him anything she might know about Michael's claims of having a wild career as an infamous bandit. She says he had described his bank holdups with an insider's knowledge. And she believes he wasn't just bragging when he said he'd moved on from robbing banks to the more challenging armored cars. Bletsky's heard enough. I made the conclusion at the time that he more than likely was our suspect, and he was responsible, and he was now holed up on the second floor. The standoff has lasted six hours. The negotiator has gradually won Michael's trust. I think between uh, midnight and 1 o'clock in the morning, he's, he's becoming a little more receptive. The conversation is becoming uh, more positive. Now I'm starting to get the feeling that I can talk to him about coming out. We all wanted to see it resolved. We wanted to be able to talk to this guy afterwards and find out, uh, you know, everything that he'd done. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, incentive to, to keep things going. At last, Ormondroid gets an indication that the impasse might break. He agrees that at, uh, at about 3.30 in the morning, he would dismantle his weapons and, and walk out. But an hour before the 3.30 deadline, without warning, Michael has another violent outburst. But no shots are fired. Once again, there is only an ominous silence. And at 3.30, nothing happens. Uh, we try calling him back, and there's no answer on the phone. Is Michael playing cat and mouse? Is he lying in wait for one last blazing shootout with police? Michael, a violent hostage taker, who claims to be a notorious armed bandit, has been holding police at bay for most of the night. And there's been no sign of surrender, only a deafening silence. We try calling him back, and uh, there's no answer on the phone. He's decided that he isn't going to talk to us again. Incident commander Keith McCaskill gives the order to take Michael down. After 11 hours of gunfire, threats, and danger, the ERU breaks in to find Michael motionless, asleep. He's taken without a struggle. It's been a flawless operation, but big questions remain. Surprisingly, Michael seems quite pleased to be in police custody. He appears eager to explain what lay behind his violent standoff and why he claims bragging rights to 35 armed robberies over the last seven years. At the time of his arrest, he was identified to us as Michael David Cernick. He was 32 years of age. 
essentially uh, educated, well-spoken, came from a good family, uh, just someone that uh, didn't fit into society, someone who uh, wanted to do other things other than jobs like yours or mine. Detective Bletsky is amazed that this character could be Winnipeg's most daring, legendary armed robber. He was much smaller, a much less imposing figure than uh, what his image would uh, have portrayed earlier. Bletsky listens as Michael Cernick openly explains how he first got into robbing banks. Why he got started with the robberies is essentially for the adrenaline rush. It was never for the money. It was strictly for seeing if he can do it. There was one particular incident where I uh, observed a mother and a couple of young children with her. Right now! And saw the terror in their eyes and decided at that point that he would never put anyone through punishment like that again. As a result, Cernick began targeting armored cars. He felt it was more of a fair fight by going after armed people. Police officers are armed, security guards are armed. Cernick is clearly enjoying telling his story. To convince Detective Bletsky that his stories are true, he proudly shows him a scar he has from one of the shootouts with an armored car guard. It was a clean entrance and exit wound, narrowly missing his Achilles tendon, narrowly missing his ankle bone. Perfect and only spot probably on his, on his foot that he could have gotten shot and be able to walk away. Detective Bletsky comes to one conclusion. Michael Cernick is the notorious bandit who has eluded police for seven years. He was never a suspect. Um, of the thousands of names that we looked through, he was um, never looked at. He was never on our list at any point. To confirm his story, Bletsky has Cernick's DNA compared to blood found at the scene of the armored car robbery two years before. It's a match. But one question remains. If he successfully avoided capture for so long, why did Cernick seize a hostage and have such a public standoff with police? He explains he went to the massage parlor intending to kill Lindsay for breaking up with him. He knew he was a somebody, but she was treating him like he was a nobody. He would kill her and kill himself and go out in a blaze of glory. But police see a deeper motivation. This whole incident was about him having the opportunity to speak out uh, to the police, to let the police know who he was and what he had been doing over these years. He was cunning, daring, dangerous, and for seven years had outsmarted police. Now he needed police to acknowledge what a professional he was, to have escaped them for so long. He admired the police, craved their approval, and even admitted he had wanted to join the force. You know who's a cop? You're not a cop. You know, cop. And I think that's why he needed to talk to a, a male police officer, uh, just so that he could brag, I guess, for the lack of a better word, about what uh, had been going on. To continue living without anyone knowing who he really was had driven him crazy. Michael Cernick never went to trial. A hostage to his own demons, he freely confessed to 35 robberies. He had stripped away the mask that concealed his secret life and demanded that someone pay attention to him. He got what he wanted for 11 short hours. And then he was put away, out of sight, out of mind sentenced to 23 years in prison.